Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. This past week, the Great Sphinx of Egypt got headlines around the world. Sky News went with scientists discover origin story of the Great Sphinx of Giza. The Independent ran with Giza Great Sphinx likely sculpted by wind long before ancient Egyptian artists gave it form. And the New York Post chose unexpected origin story of Egypt's Great Sphinx unearthed by NYU researchers. The headlines were written for clicks. Of course, as a YouTuber I understand that. But what is the crux of the articles? What have the NYU researchers actually discovered? Well, let's look at the Sky News article, one of the biggest news channels in the UK. They start by saying, quote, With the face of a woman and the body of a lion, the Great Sphinx of Giza has enthralled and mystified archaeologists for thousands of years. End quote. This, of course, is a very bizarre way to start an article. I would love to read an account from an archaeologist who lived thousands of years ago who was baffled by the Great Monument especially as the foundations of archaeology were not laid until the 15th century. And the face of a woman? I know that some people do think that, but the vast majority do not. On reading the beginning of this article, I thought it best to read no more, and so I contacted NYU directly, and they were kind enough to send me their study. The fact is, the researchers conducted a very specific and hypothetical study which has been sensationalised by the media. The idea being tested is, could nature have created a lion-like piece of bedrock which then inspired the Egyptians to shape it into their Sphinx monument? Leif Ristroff, an associate professor at NYU, said, quote, our findings offer a possible origin story for how sphinx-like formations can come about from erosion. End quote. Yardangs are wind-eroded rock formations in arid regions, and they mention the fact they can resemble seated lions. And so the idea is that maybe the Great Sphinx already looked somewhat lion-like when the Egyptians stumbled upon the outcrop of rock. Then they merely finished the job that nature had started. So that seems like a fair claim. The scientists try to replicate the non-uniform composition of the Sphinx limestone, using a small mound of bentonite clay with a non-erodible inclusion for the head. They shape the clay into a half ellipsoid and align the long axis with the flow from a water tunnel. The inclusion is a short plastic cylinder and it was placed near the front and top of the mound, and this is supposed to simulate the head a material that in their experiment would be resistant to erosion, to mimic the bedrock changes we see at the Sphinx. After hours of being subject to the flow of a water tunnel, a neck had formed below the short cylinder, and crude pores at the base. The experiment did produce a rough lion-like sculpture, and yes, if you walked across a barren Giza plateau and saw this, you'd certainly think that this chunk of bedrock had a natural animal shape. Regarding the experiment, the paper does go into a lot of detail how streak-like imaging containing filaments of dye shows how the sculpture was formed in a very visual way. And yes, these images are pretty cool. But just how relevant is this study to the Great Sphinx of Egypt? Well, the paper just shows that with a constant flow of water, mimicking air, and coming constantly from one direction, directly in front, a half ellipsoid mound with a single piece of hard rock at the top can be naturally shaped into a rough lion. But I have to say, this has absolutely no bearing whatsoever on the origins of the Great Sphinx of Egypt, and I'll explain why. For a start, the Great Sphinx sits inside a hollow. It's inside the Sphinx enclosure. To create its form thousands of years ago, people had to quarry down, meaning that if we filled in the enclosure and put back the bedrock that has been removed, making the base of the monument level with the surface of the present-day plateau, the Great Sphinx has no front paws. This shows instantly that the experiment by the NYU researchers does not explain how the Sphinx was formed. 
In their experiment, the pores occurred naturally. In real life, the pores were excavated and shaped by man. It therefore could never have had a natural line shape. Maybe an elongated limestone hill with a crude head, but nothing like this. Furthermore, the wind at Giza is not constant from one direction. For example, over the next few days, the wind direction on the plateau is blowing from the northeast to southwest. This experiment only accounts for a constant wind direction from east to west. And the Great Sphinx of Giza has not only been subject to wind erosion. Over millions of years since the actual formation of the limestone, the rock itself has been weathered, and then after being exposed above ground, the same rock has been eroded. The rock has been subject to tectonic forces, and there are large cracks running through the Great Sphinx. It's also been subject to groundwater wicking and salt exfoliation, to rainfall and rainwater running off the plateau, and yes, also wind erosion, but blowing from various directions. The erosion of the Great Sphinx is a highly complex subject, with many variables to consider. I think the experiment simplifies everything a bit too much. The starting model is also completely wrong. For a start, as stated, the Sphinx sits inside a hollow, and so their model is too big. Most of what we call the Sphinx today was in fact below ground level, before humans opened up the Sphinx enclosure quarry. If anything, the model that was used by the researchers should have looked more like this, because this model has no bearing on the Great Sphinx. And then the researchers have also put a cylinder at the top and front of their mound, buried inside it, like this. But in real life, the hard rock that makes up the Sphinx head actually went right across the entire plateau. It was a constant bed of rock. It's the same rock that was quarried from Giza to build the Great Pyramid, and we can see another outcrop at GCF1. The very top of the Sphinx head is the original ground level of the Giza Plateau. There wasn't an inclusion of hard rock buried inside the soft limestone, like what is shown here. I guess the monument could have once been a yardang that looked like this, but it certainly never started out like this. It doesn't seem like a geologist was consulted at all. I've already said how the bottom parts of the Great Sphinx were quarried by man. But even so, they also haven't added a harder sloping layer at the bottom of their model. We know that members 1 and 3, the bottom and top of the Great Sphinx are hard, and that member 2 in the middle is softer. All the experiment tells us is that if the Great Sphinx was originally a yardang of homogeneous soft limestone, with an isolated inclusion of hard rock inside it, and if it was subject only to wind erosion, and only if the wind was blowing in an east-west direction over a long period of time, then a sphinx-like monument can form naturally. But none of the assumptions made for the experiment simulate what we see at Giza. And also, because the pores of the sphinx were quarried from the enclosure, the results actually show the opposite of what's being claimed by the media. Their experiment actually shows the Great Sphinx was not formed in this way. The pores of the lion did not exist until quarrying began. Yardangs are of course a real thing, and in some settings, wind is funnelled in specific directions. Natural outcrops of rock can look like faces, people, shapes and animals, and so, in some parts of the world, if an arid desert is subject to wind from one direction, and if there is a relatively small inclusion of harder stone sitting inside softer rock, then yes, I guess their study does show that nature can form a lion-shaped rock. But do any examples actually exist that fit the criteria being tested? On a poster that was made public by the scientists, they write, These results show what ancient people may have encountered in the deserts of Egypt, and why they envisioned a fantastic creature. But based on the method of the experiment, the way their model was set up, getting the bedrock layering all wrong, forgetting the fact the Sphinx sits inside a hollow, 
not varying the wind direction, not accounting for the natural tectonic fractures in the monument, not considering all of the weathering and erosional forces, not considering the changes in climate over time. Well, in my opinion, the study is, in truth, quite irrelevant to the study of the Great Sphinx. And that's not me being argumentative for clicks. I think that is a fair and balanced assessment. I have no doubt their experiment can explain why some Yardangs do look animal-like, and the scientists admit that their findings hardly resolve the mysteries behind Yardangs and the Great Sphinx, but, as stated, I don't think this work tells us anything new about the origins of this enigmatic monument. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.